Section 4.4, Optimization Problems. So in previous sections, we've been looking at finding maximum and minimums on graphs, and now we want to start to apply that knowledge of extreme values to applications. So some examples might include minimizing costs, maximizing profits, maximize areas, volumes, minimize distances and times, things along those lines, and we'll see examples like that as we go through the section. We're going to start off, though, with a fairly basic example, which is just numerical. Kind of find our way through that process, and then we'll come up with a procedure to apply to these applications, and then we'll start looking at more complicated examples. All right, so let's start off with this first one. We want to minimize the product of two, two numbers whose difference is 100. So the first thing to do is to get some variables in the problem. So let's let x and y be the two numbers. And then let's write down the equation for what it is that we're trying to find a minimum or maximum for. And they ask us to minimize the product. So we'll just put a P for product, and that product is going to be X times Y. So we want to try and figure out the value of the two numbers that make that as small as possible. But we have what's called a constraint on that. We're being told that the two numbers have a difference of 100. So the key to these problems is to use these constraints to get rid of one of your input variables so that you can take a derivative and find a maximum and minimum. So we're going to use that constraint to write another equation. So if the difference is 100, that means that x minus y equals 100. And then let's solve for either of the variables. Looks like it's easiest to solve for x here if we just add y to both sides. So x is equal to y plus 100. Once we get to that point, we can make a substitution. So we can say, since we know x is y plus 100, we can take this x right here and replace it by y plus 100. So if we do that, instead of x, we have y plus 100. And then that's still times the other y. But notice now the only variable in our function is y. So now we can say we've written the product as a function of y. And when you get to that point, now you can take a derivative and use that derivative to try and come up with the max or minimum that you're looking for. So to take the derivative here, it would be nice to clear the parentheses first. So that way we don't have to use the product rule. So distributing the y, we get y squared plus 100y. Now we can take the derivative by just using the power rule, which is nice and simple. So p prime of y is equal to 2y plus 100. We're taking our derivative here with respect to y, derivative of p with respect to y, so there's no chain rule or y prime that needs to be involved. You can see there, if we thought about setting that equal to 0, we'd move the 100 over and divide by 2, so we'd get y equals negative 50. So that's our critical number. So we make a sign chart for p prime of y where the critical number on that sign chart is negative 50. And then we do some testing. So if you put 0 into the derivative, so if we plug 0 into that derivative right here, we'd get 0 plus 100, which would be 100, and that's positive. And 0 is to the right of negative 50, so we'd have positives over here on the right. That was a linear factor, which means that it was a factor to the first power. So there will be a sign change at 50, so on the other side, you'll have negatives. You can test that if you need to. And then what does that tell us? It means that our function was decreasing on the way into negative 50 and increasing on the way out. And if we're de decreasing on the way in, increasing on the way out, then we have a local minimum there. And what were we trying to do for the product? We were trying to minimize it. So now we know where that happens. The minimum occurs for which two numbers? Negative 50 is one of them. And then what do we know about the other one? We know that the other one would be, so we found y, so the other one would be x, and x would be equal to negative 50 plus 100. 
So that's going to be positive 50. So the minimum occurs for negative 50 and positive 50. That's where you're going to get the minimum product for two numbers whose difference is 100. So there's our answer to that one. And we've got a glimpse into the procedure we're going to use. Now let's try and summarize that procedure. So these are the guidelines for optim optimization in an application problem. The first thing is to determine the objective function. And the objective function is the one that's going to be optimized, or another way of saying that is it's the one that you're trying to find the maximum or the minimum for. And then determine any constraints. So that's some other equation you can write that's going to help you get rid of a variable or two if needed. So the next thing is to do that. Use the constraints to rewrite the object objective function with only one independent variable, meaning only one input variable. So on the example that we just did at first, our objective function p was written as a function of x and y. But then we used the constraint to get rid of the x, and then it, we had our objective function p as just a function of y. Once we managed to do that, we could use calculus to find max and min. So what does that mean? It means we took derivatives, right? Sometimes you'll have endpoints on what's possible for your values of x or y. Here they were any two numbers, so their range was kind of unlimited. But if you do have some sort of naturally occurring endpoints to your application, then you need to keep those in mind because it's possible you'll have a max or a min there, though it usually doesn't happen. All right, let's go ahead and move on and look at another example and try and apply this procedure. All right, so they want us to find the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in a right triangle with legs of length 3 centimeters and 4 centimeters with two sides of the rectangle along the legs of the triangle. So I've set up an XY coordinate system here that's going to be helpful to us. And then I'm going to draw a connector between the two so that the two axes in that line I just drew form a rectangle. And we want that to be a right triangle, which it is because the X and Y meet at a 90 degree angle. And then we want one of the legs to be like three centimeters. We can create that by making this point right here be three zero. And then that bottom length is going to be three. And if we make this point up top 0, 4, that would make the height along the y-axis of that triangle to be 4. So that gives us the two legs of 3 and 4 like they requested. Then they want us to draw a rectangle inside of that triangle. So I'm going to go ahead and just draw any old version of that. So here's our rectangle. And the other two sides are along the axes. So they want us to figure out whether they want a max or a min there. Find the area of the largest rectangle. So they want us to maximize the area of that rectangle. So the first thing to do would be to come up with a formula for that area. So we can do that by saying this point right here on the corner is x comma y. Because then that would mean that this is x and this is y in terms of the heights and the width and length of the rectangle. And so then our area for that rectangle just becomes the product of x and y. So we want to somehow get rid of one of those two variables. Then we can end up taking a derivative. And once we have the derivative, we can find that largest area like they're requesting. All right, so the reason I set up this triangle on the coordinate system with the x and y axis is so that I could come up with an equation for that blue line that I drew to form the triangle. So the slope of that blue line, it's, got, it's going across 3 and down 4. So the vertical change is 4, but that's a downward line, so I'll make that a negative 4, and the horizontal change is 3. So we have a slope of negative 4 thirds, and a y-intercept of 0, 4, which means we this is b, and y equals mx plus b, and we can go straight to y equals the slope, negative 4 thirds times x and plus b. Whoops, but we know the b. The b is 4. So once we do that, now we have a value we can use to substitute. So we can take y equals negative 4 thirds x plus 4 and use that to replace that y 
in our objective function. So then our area will be a function of just x, and it will be x times the y value, but the y value is negative 4 thirds times x plus 4. So that gives us our function of one variable. Let's clear parentheses on that. So multiply or distribute the x in there. So we get negative 4 thirds x squared plus 4x. Once we clear the parentheses, it's easy to take a derivative. So we'll go ahead and do that next. A prime of x is equal to, bring that 2 down, we would get negative 8 thirds times x plus 4. And then we just want to set that equal to 0 and solve. So we can move the 8 thirds over to the other side if we set it equal to 0 first. So then we get 4 equals 8 thirds x. And then we multiply both sides by 3 eighths. So multiplying by 3 eighths over here cancels the 3 and the 8. Multiply by 3 eighths on the other side. 4 goes into that 8 twice. And it looks like we have a solution there for our critical point of, what did we get there? x equals 3 over 2 is what's left over. Let's go ahead and squeeze that in right here. So there's the x equals 3 halves. Now we just want to verify that that's really a max because they did tell us to maximize here. So I'm going to make a sign chart. This sign chart is for a prime. It has one critical number on it at 3 halves. And then we need a test number. When 0 is not a critical number, it makes a good test number. So what if we plug 0 into our first derivative right there? We'd get negative 8 thirds times 0, so just 0 plus 4. So at 0, we would get a positive 4. 0 is over here on the left side of our critical number, so those would be positives. When your derivative is a linear function, it will always have a sign change at its critical number, so the other side will be negative. So we have increasing before 3 halves, decreasing afterwards. That means we have a local max which is good news because they want us to find the area of the largest rectangle possible. So that's the largest area we can do. And what do they want us to do for the end part? Find the area of the largest rectangle. So the answer is going to be the area, not the X and the Y, but the area. So all we have to do now is take that three halves and plug it into the area function. So we just do area of three halves. And where do we plug that in? What's the best place? Uh, we could just do it right here. It's a decent spot to plug in the 3 halves, I suppose. So we get negative 4 thirds times 3 halves squared plus 4 times 3 halves. And squeezing that in a little bit, if you work out the first part, you get 9 fourths, the fours cancel, the 3 goes into the 9 three times, you end up with negative 3 for this first piece. This 2 goes into that 4 twice, 2 times 3 is 6, so negative 3 plus 6, we end up with 3. And then what would the units be on the area? The side lengths were 3 centimeters and 4 centimeters, so, so since the side lengths are in centimeters, the area would be in centimeters squared. And that piece right there would be our overall answer. So the largest area possible is 3 centimeters squared for a rectangle inscribed in that triangle. All right, moving on to the next example. By cutting away identical squares from each corner of a rectangular piece of cardboard and folding up the resulting flaps, the cardboard may be turned into an open box. If the cardboard is 16 inches long and 10 inches wide, find the dimensions of the box that will, le will yield the maximum volume. So we're going to try and maximize volume, so we'd want to come up with an objective function, which is a formula for the volume of that box, but right now we're just looking at a piece of cardboard, not a box. So where does the box come from? They said we're going to go to each corner and we're going to cut out a square. So we're going to cut out the same size square from every one of those corners. 
When we do that, we can then fold up the flaps that result from that cutting. So now to help us move towards a solution, I'm going to go ahead and introduce a variable and say the side length of those squares that are cut out is x by x. And then let's draw a picture of the rectangle that would be inside. Once you cut those out and you end up with this rectangle inside, which I'm doing in red, that's going to be the base of your box. And then those little flaps all around it will be folded up to create the sides. So let's say that this is L and this is W. And then when you fold those box lengths up, it creates some height. So the volume of that box is going to end up being... Sorry, just trying to switch colors here. He's being stubborn. All right, so the volume of that box is going to end up being the length times the width times the height. So there's our objective function that we're going to try and maximize, but we need to get it down to one variable. And what I'm going to do is try and make that variable x in every case. So what do we know about the length? The length of that red piece was 16, but then we cut this section off up here, and we cut this section off down there. Each of those sections we cut off was an x, but there's two of them. So that length would be 16 minus 2x. And then how about the width? The width has the same thing going on. The width was 10, but then we cut off this part from the width, and we cut off that part from the width. So the width was 10, but we cut off x twice, so it'll be 10 minus 2x. And then the height is formed by the piece we cut. So the height is going to be x. So then we can write the volume as a function of x by just doing all these sub substitutions. So the, the L is 16 minus 2x. And the W is 10 minus 2x. And the height is just x. And from there, we just want to go ahead and simplify that and then take its derivative. So I'm going to go ahead and do FOIL here, but I'm going to do it in a descending order way, and I'm going to copy that x from over here. I'm going to copy that out front. And then negative 2x times negative 2x, that's 4x squared. And then go to the x terms. We have a negative 32x on the outside, a negative 20x on the inside. Combining those would be negative 52x. And the constant term is 16 times 10, so that would be plus 160. And then if we multiply the 4 in, we get 4x cubed. Sorry, multiplying the x in, we get 4x cubed minus 52x squared. And then plus 160 times x. And when we get to that point, now we've just got a polynomial, so very easy to take the derivative v prime at this point, it's just using the power rule, so bring down the 3, we get 12x squared. Bring down the 2, we get minus 104x. And then derivative of x is 1, so we're just left with that 160. So there's our derivative, now we want to find critical points, so that means we want to factor. You can factor a 4 out as a GCF. That will leave 3x squared minus 26x plus 40. And then we need to factor that quadratic. Because it's a 3x squared, it has to be 3x and x if it's going to factor. And then to fill in the other two blanks, I personally favor the AC test to help me figure this out. So I multiply those two numbers together. So three times 40 is 120. And then I try and think of two numbers that multiply to that product of 120 and add up to the middle number of negative 26. We know that two numbers that multiply to 120 or three and 40, because that's how we got the 120 in the first place. But that would add up to negative, or sorry, 43 if we want any chance of this working, we'd have to make both of those negative, but it still doesn't work because it adds up to negative 26. 
We're not, um, we need it to add up to negative 26, but it's adding up to negative 43. And when the sum you have currently is too big, it means your numbers are too far apart. So let's try some numbers that are closer together that it multiply to 120, like 6 and 20. Again, make them both negative. And now when you add those two together, you do get negative 26, which is the middle term. So these two numbers now become the key to doing the factoring. And what they become is the outer and inner products. So 3 times whatever I put right here has to either give me the negative 6 or the negative 20. If I put a negative 2 right there, 3 times negative 2 would give me the negative 6. This other product right here has to give me the negative 20, and since that's a 1 in front of the x, it would need to be a negative 20 there. And that will always work if you try and create those two numbers that multiply to 120 and add up to the middle term. If you create those as your outer and inner products, that will always work for the factoring. And you can check the full factoring to see that it does, in fact, work. So that appears, at first, to give us two critical points, x equals 20 thirds and x equals 2. And in fact, if we were just trying to find the extremes of v of x, then we would have two critical points. But there are some constraints on our value of, of x. So if you go back up to the top, let's make a quick note about this. You can't have any size x you want because x has to be cut out of a box <clears throat> that has a width of 10 right here. The smallest, since it's going to be a width that x can be, is 0. Can't have a negative width. But since you need to make two cuts out of a length that is 10, the maximum that that cut could possibly be is 5. If you try and cut more than 5 out, there's not enough box for that. So x has to be somewhere between 0 and 5. So why does that matter? Because 20 thirds is 6 point something. So that's not a possible cut that could be made out of this box. So we really only have one critical point that matters, which is the x equals 2. So let's go ahead and make a sign chart now for v prime. We'll put the only critical point that matters to. We can go ahead and list our boundaries of 0 and 5. And those could potentially be where the max and min come from, the 0 and the 5. But let's check a sign chart first. So what if you plug 0 into the derivative? So... What if you plug 0 in right there and right there for the x? Those two terms would drop out. You'd be left with 160. So plugging in a 0 gives a positive for the derivative. When you cross over 2, because that came from something that was to the first power, you'll get a sign change. So these will be minuses. So our function was increasing before the 2, decreasing afterwards. So what does that mean? That's going to be a local max. Now, fortunately, we're looking for a local, or we're looking for a max, and so that max is going to occur at two. Um, because of the way we increase in and decrease out of there, the values at zero and five have to be lower. If we were looking for a minimum area, then we would plug the zero and the five in, and see which one of those was the lower value. But if you go back up here, we're trying to find maximum volume. So that maximum volume is going to occur when x equals two. So what does that imply about the situation? If x equals 2, that tells us that L has to be, so let's see, go up to the top, what was L? 16 minus 2x. So 16 minus 2 times 2. So that's going to be a 12. And what were the units on this? I think it was inches. Yeah, it was inches. So we're going to want a length of 12 inches. The width was 10 minus 2 times x, so 10 minus 4, so that's going to be 6 inches. And then finally the height was just the x, which was 2, and I'll just line them all up, so that would be 2 inches. So that's going to be the length, the width, and the height. And they asked, what are the dimensions that maximize the volume? So there they all are with units included. All right, that wraps up that example.
All right, next example, find the point on the line 6x plus y equals 9 that is closest to the point negative 3, 1. Let's start off by drawing a picture of that. So I'll set up a coordinate system over here. We just need a quick rough graph. It doesn't need to be perfect by any means, but just to visualize what's going on. So we have our x and our y coordinate system. Let's draw this line. To do that, it's helpful to solve for y, so move the 6x to the other side. This becomes y equals negative 6x plus 9. In that slope-intercept form, we could see the y-intercept would be 0, 9, so we'll draw that up here somewhere. And then, since the slope is negative, the line would have a downward path from there. Again, not trying to draw it perfect or worry about scale, but just a rough idea. And then the point that we're trying to engage with this line is negative 3, 1. So that would be left, you know, 1, 2, 3, up 1 type of thing. So somewhere around here would be our negative 3, 1. And we're trying to find where on that slanted line that I drew is the closest point to that negative 3, 1. Geometry tells us it would happen when you get a right angle right here. And so you can actually use geometry methods to try and figure this out but we're gonna try and use calculus methods instead. So how are we gonna approach that? Well, we'll use the distance formula to get a start on it. So the distance set between two points, and the two points are negative three, one, and then this point x, y somewhere on the line. The distance between two points is the square root of the difference in their x value squared plus the difference in their y value squared. But it turns out that if you take the derivative of that formula, there's going to be some chain rule mess because of having all that stuff inside of a square root. And then it also turns out that if you're trying to find a minimum of a distance, it's the same place where you would get the minimum of the square of the distance. So when you're trying to figure out what x and y minimize the distance, you can just figure out instead what x and y minimize the square of the distance. It'll give you the same answer but it'll be easier derivatives with the square root gone. So we square both sides. We get a formula for the square of the, di the distance, which is the difference in the x value squared plus the difference in the y value squared. And now we're gonna go ahead and apply that here. So for this picture, d squared would be the difference in the x values so you take x minus the minus 3, and the two minuses make a plus, and then that's squared, plus y minus the y coordinate, which is a 1, squared. And that is our objective function. This is what we're trying to maximize. Let's call that f, just to put like a function type of name on it. So f is x plus 3 squared plus y minus 1 squared, and we're trying to make f as small as possible. All right, but we want it to also only have one variable, so how are we going to get at that? Well, we know from right here that y is equal to negative 6x plus 9, so we can replace that value of y by negative 6x plus 9. And if we do that, we'll only have x values in our function, so at that point it would become an f of x function. The left part will stay the same, x plus 3 squared. But the right part, we're going to substitute for that y, negative 6x plus 9. And then still the minus 1 is there. And then all squared. So simplifying that a little bit, we get x plus 3 squared plus negative 6x plus 8 squared. Now we could clear the parentheses and combine like terms. The other option is just go ahead and jump right into the derivative and use the chain rule. So I'm going to do that. Bring the 2 down, and we get 2 times x plus 3 now to the first power, times the derivative of the inside, but the derivative of the inside is just a 1, so that has no effect. And then on the next one, bring the 2 down. Negative 6x plus 8 stays the same inside. We now have an exponent of 1 and times the derivative of the inside, which now, this time, there is a substantial number, the negative 6, so it does have an effect. So we have to write that piece in. 
All right, so we've got our derivative. Now we just want to get to a point where we can see what the critical numbers are. So we can just start clearing parentheses. We have 2x plus 6 from the first piece. That's a 2 and the negative 6 is a negative 12. Negative 12 times negative 6 would be plus 72 times x. Negative 12 times, what would that be? Negative 12 times 8 would be 96. And then we can combine like terms some more. So we have 74x minus 90. So if we set that equal to 0, we're going to get 74x equals 90. Divide both sides by 74. And we get x equals 90 over 74. That can be reduced because they're both even. So if you reduce that, you get 45 over 37. So this is most likely the x-coordinate of the point that we want. I say most likely because what if that was the maximum distance instead of the minimum distance? So to verify that we really have a minimum distance and therefore the closest point on the line to negative 3, negative 1, I'm going to make a sign chart for this f prime, where the critical number is 45 over 37. And then we want a test point. So 0, when it's not a critical number, makes a nice test point. So if I plug 0 into the derivative right here, I would get negative 90 for the derivative. 0 is on the left of my critical point. So these would be negatives. These would be positives. We're hoping for a minimum. Good news, the function is decreasing on the way in, increasing on the way out. That creates a local minimum. When you only have one local minimum, that always is your absolute minimum. So we know we're going to get the smallest possible distance at this x value. So now all we need to know is the y value that goes with it because they asked for the closest point. So that closest point would be an ordered pair. But remember, we have an equation for that line. It's y equals negative 6x plus 9. So that's y equals negative 6 times do 6 over 1 times 45 30 sevenths plus 9, which if you write that as 9 over 1 and multiply top and bottom by 37, that would create a common denominator between the two. And I did that work already. That works out to 63 over 37. So they wanted to know what is the closest point on the line to that point, negative 3, 1, we know, now know the x and the y. So we can write our final answer here. The closest point, which is what they asked for, is the ordered pair, 45, 37, divided by 63, 37. All right. That wraps up this example. All right, our next and final example, a box with a square base and an open top must have a volume of 32,000 cubic centimeters. Find, find the dimensions of the box that minimize the amount of material used. So I'm gonna draw a little box over here on the side. And I'm gonna say its height is H and its base is x, and then they say it's got a square base, so as I draw the rest of the box in here, this must be an x back here as well, and we can complete the box. So there's a, a picture of our box, and what do they want us to do? Find the dimensions of the box that minimize the amount of material used. So if our goal is to minimize the amount of material used, we're trying to minimize surface area. It says it has an open top, which means there's no material on the top. So this box has four sides and one bottom. So its surface area would be four times the area of a side, and any side has an area of x times h. And then plus the area of the base, which since the base is square, that would be plus an x squared. So the surface area is 4xh plus x squared. So that's great. 
uh, but it has two variables in it. So we can't take derivative yet. So what we need to do is find a constraint. The constraint is that the volume is 32,000 cubic centimeters. So they tell us the volume is 32,000, but we also know that the volume would be length times width times height. And if you do length times width times height for this particular box, that would be x times x times h. So we know that 32,000 is equal to x squared h. So it seems like the simplest thing to do is divide both sides by x squared. And then we would have h equals, and then we can substitute into the constraint. So here's our h by itself. There's the h in the constraint, so we're going to substitute right in there. And now we're going to have s as just a function of x. And it's going to be 4 times x times what was the h, which will now be 32,000 over x squared, and then plus x squared. So now we've got that as a function of just one variable, so we want to try and simplify it, and then find a derivative, find critical points, same thing we've been doing. All right, so let's keep working on this. Surface area is a function of x. We could say that this x right here would cancel one of those x's right there. If we do that, 4 times 32 is 128,000. And then we would only have one x in the bottom plus that other x squared. And then just rearranging a little bit, I'll put the x squared out front. And then on the 128,000 piece, I'm going to bring that x up top and raise it to the negative first. And the reason I want to do that is it allows me to use the, the uh, power rule when I do the derivative. So now s prime of x, take the derivative, we get 2x, bring the negative 1 down, so negative 128,000 times x to the power 1 less, so we subtract, we get a negative 2. We can write that as 2x minus 128,000 over x squared. And if I take that now and set it equal to 0, I can try and solve. So 0 equals, so I'm trying to find critical points, right? So 0 equals 2x minus 128,000. Whoops, sorry. We already, we already wrote the minus. 2x minus 128,000 over x squared. And when I do that... I can now multiply both sides by x squared, and that will get rid of the fractions and make this easier to solve. So on the left, we'll still have 0. On the right, 2x times x squared is 2x cubed. And then the x squareds cancel in the next multiplication, and I just get minus 128,000. I could divide everything here by 2 just to simplify the numbers a little bit. And then I can move that, let's see, 128,000 divided by two will be 64,000. Could move that over to the other side. So 64,000 would now equal x cubed after I cancel those twos off. So now I take the cube root of both sides. So x is the cube root of 64,000 which fortunately for us, instead of working out to be some messy decimal, turns out really nice. It's just the number 40. So now we want to check to see if that gives a minimum or a maximum. So we're going to make a sign chart for S prime. I'm going to put 40 on there. So now let's go back to the derivative and plug in a test number. So let's look at this part right here of the derivative and plug in a test number. How about if we plug in the number 1? If we plug in 1, we get 2 minus 128,000, which is negative. So if you plug in the number 1, which is on the left, you get a negative. As you cross over 40, since that was an odd power, the x to the third, we should get a sign change there. So this should be plus on the other side, but you could test a number like 50 in the derivative if you'd like. And we're decreasing on the way in, increasing on the way out. So that looks like a local minimum. 
and what were we trying to find here? We were trying to minimize the amount of area. So if we're trying to minimize and we just found a minimum, that is good news. So when does the minimum happen? It happens when x is 40. And then, let's see, did they want the dimensions? Did they want the, the area, the material? Let's see. Find the dimensions of the box that minimize it. So we just found that x is 40. So the, si the base has, is 40 by 40, and the height we'll figure out with the equation. So let's come down here and summarize our dimensions. So the base is 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters. And then for the height, I guess the best place to go for the height would be where we had H solve for, which is right there. So H is 32,000 over X squared. So some scratch work over here, H is 32,000 divided by 40 squared. And if you do that, you get a 20. So the base is 40 centimeters by 40 centimeters with the height of the box, 20 centimeters. All right, that wraps up section 4.4.